In the 19th century, Britain was the country which gave the world the Industrial Revolution, initiating an era of technological transformation, fossil fuel use and rising climate temperatures. Now, in the 21st century, its politicians and pundits are talking of a very different kind of leadership in the fight against climate change. Our COP26 will not be the end of climate change. It can and it must mark the beginning of the end. We were the first country to uh, pass legislation uh, for net zero. We have been fastest to decarbonise our economy. I think we are doing a great job of getting on with meeting our climate ambitions and demonstrating leadership to the world. Britain's claims to leadership rest on some impressive numbers, both past and present. Its government claims that CO2 emissions have fallen by 44% since 1990, more than any other G20 nation, with the ambition for them to fall by 78% come 2035. Then there are impressive objectives on low emissions vehicles, reforestation and increasing wind power. And of course, the fact that Britain in 2019 became the first country in the world to enshrine a commitment to net zero in law. Which means it's a fair question. Is Britain a leader on climate change? Britain likes to think of itself as a leader on climate change. And since the days even of Margaret Thatcher has been promoting itself on the world stage as an environmental leader and more recently as a climate leader. It is mankind and his activities which are changing the environment of our planet in damaging and dangerous ways. They have some evidence um, and they have some big claims to make about their leadership on climate, but the evidence against them is also pretty substantial. We really have to start by understanding our historic role in terms of empire. The architecture of the world financially and economically is still kind of as we and the Americans designed it over the last 200 years. And that's still set up to extract resources, often fossil fuel resources, from the global south in order to you know, power the kind of lifestyles, particularly the wealthiest in the global north. Starting in the colonial era, the UK extracted something like 45 trillion dollars from the Indian subcontinent alone during its colonial rule of the subcontinent. And since then has promoted a trade regime that extracts and exploits, that imposes loan conditions on countries vulnerable to climate change impacts. In the mid-19th century, the UK was alone uh, responsible for 60% of CO2 emissions. And uh, it remained by far the largest uh, uh, consumer of coal, which was the fossil fuel in the world deep into the 19th century. So it's undeniable that Britain bears substantial historic responsibility for climate change. After all, it was the country which gave the world the Industrial Revolution. But isn't that a separate question to whether or not it's offering leadership now in the 21st century? Perhaps it's a question of whether or not it's changed its tune. Does allowing the Cambo oil and gas field off Shetland to go ahead now set a good example around the world? When there is a, a announcement, an agreement, of course, I'm very happy to come back and talk to you. The UK government is actually trying to push the new Campbell oil field through the UK Parliament. And um, this oil field would be due to extract 170 million barrels of oil in only its first period of extraction and be in commission until the year 2050, by which point the UK has actually pledged to be net zero. It doesn't matter how many wind turbines you build or solar panels or anything else, if you still expand oil and gas and coal. Internationally, the focus has been on coal as the fossil fuel that everybody needs to quickly relegate to history. Um, but oil and gas, I think, is the next frontier for the climate movement and for just the discussion around keeping fossil fuels in the ground. In short, the UK government is the second largest oil and gas producer in Europe. It currently has a legal duty under statute to maximise the economic recovery of offshore oil and gas, which means that if it is profitable, if you make one pence out of it, it's coming out of the ground. Um, and at the moment, the UK government has absolutely no plans to wind down oil and gas production, even though we know that the burning of oil and gas is responsible, together with coal, for 80% of carbon emissions, which is what's driving the climate crisis. The Campbell oil field is actually just the tip of the iceberg and the UK government is trying to open 40 new coal, oil and gas projects just by the year 2025. To say that they're a climate leader is absolutely ludicrous. So while Britain has made substantial progress in reducing its CO2 emissions since the late 20th century, claims of climate leadership are somewhat misplaced. 
Unlike China and India, it's not even doing enough to make up for its own historic share of CO2 emissions. Well, I believe that we have a moral duty to leave this world in a better condition than uh, what we inherited. And that's why today we're announcing that we will be ending our contribution to climate change by 2050 and legislating for a net zero emissions target. If you accept the 2050 goal, which of course climate scientists tell us we need to be at zero by 2050, that would mean that rich countries are going to consume even more what's left of the, of the carbon pie. Now imagine, this is like going for a pizza. Somebody eats six slices of the pizza, you get to the seventh slice and says, forget I've eaten the six slices. We've got the seventh to share. And by the way, you have to pick up the full tab. Now this is both immoral uh, and it's illegal in international law because it's written that rich countries in the convention, that rich countries would do their fair share of effort. If we were going to fairly allocate emissions to keep in line with Paris Agreement targets, the UK has emitted something like 200% of its fair share, and that requires drastic reductions now within the UK, and it requires helping countries within the Global South that are on the front line of climate change impacts to make the transition themselves. Can there be peace and prosperity if one third of the world literally prospers and the other two thirds of the world live under siege and face calamitous threats to our well-being? The reason why there's a vulnerability in the world, the reason why half the world is locked in poverty, the reason why two billion people go hungry, billions of people don't have access to health and education, is because we are stealing money from the Global South. Each and every dollar that the Global North sends to the Global South, $24 flows the other way. The idea that the North is giving charity to the Global South, no, the Global South has built the Global North and it's now time for reparations. It's now time for redistributing wealth and technology. We have to, the only way to solve these crises is cooperation and solidarity, not profit and competition. Today, I'm announcing that the UK will go further and become the first ever net zero aligned financial centre. You know, I think that the main role that the British state really has and the Britain has in climate politics is as the main protector of the wealth of these kind of carbon billionaires. And um, without understanding that role, you can't really get your head around why it is that Britain, I think, is still one of the most responsible countries in the world for climate change. Britain's climate leadership, I would say, is pretty strongly undermined by the fact that they don't really want to talk about the dirty secret, which is the role that the financial system plays in perpetuating you know, the fossil fuel industry, but other industries like steel and cement, and basically kind of having a stranglehold over the real economy. There's that remarkable statistic that if the city of London were a country, it would be the world's ninth largest emitter, I think, just based on you know one year of carbon emissions from banks and asset managers. And that doesn't even include the insurance sector, without which you know none of these fossil fuel projects would go ahead. Um, and so we can talk all we want about decarbonizing our own energy system, but the reality is that we're you know propping up carbon emissions throughout the world um, and not really willing to do anything about that. The UK is rigging the rules through its involvement in the IMF and the World Bank in restricting the space that developing countries have to invest in the systems that are going to help them transition and improve their resilience to climate change impacts that they did very little to cause. Given that most countries in the Global South have contributed minimally to this crisis, they have also um, been restricted in what they can do due to loan conditions that UK banks, UK governments, UK funded multilateral institutions like the IMF and the World Bank have imposed on them. The money that is on the table, 80% of it is in debt creating loans. So the rich countries are basically saying, not only are we burning down your house, when we give you a loan to fix your house, you pay us back for it. There have been 25 COPs before this one. And every year, leaders come to these climate negotiations with an array of new pledges, commitments and promises. And as each COP comes and goes, emissions continue to rise. If the UK was to be a leader, it would take responsibility for the fact that its outsized emissions are contributing to climate change impacts today and pay for repairing the consequences. It's estimated that half a million children under the age of five are experiencing a climate-induced famine in Madagascar. 300,000 people are being impacted by floods in the DRC. 
the average person in the UK emits something like 65 more times CO2 than the average person in the DRC, 45 times more the average person in Madagascar. So real leadership would look like reducing emissions here, but paying for the consequences of accelerating climate change impacts in the global south. Britain has a long and imperial history of stretching hundreds of years of expansion and exploitation of both resources and people. And that wealth has given Britain both its economic power, but it's uh, positioned it at the centre of both the global financial economy, the fossil fuel industry, and the multinationals that are based here, many of them domiciled here, who are responsible for most of the pollution and injustices around the world. Britain's own story is actually a story of being a climate laggard rather than a climate champion. So is Britain a leader on climate change? Well, despite what the politicians and media pundits might say, not really. While it's true that it's made substantial progress on reducing CO2 emissions since 1990, the idea that it's a leader on climate because it's virtually eliminated coal from its energy mix is rather strange when one considers it continues to drill for both oil and gas domestically. Britain gave the world the Industrial Revolution and thus helped birth man-made climate change. And while it may no longer be a leading climate culprit, is it offering leadership on what matters most, namely creating a world beyond fossil fuels? Well, the answer to that is crystal clear. Absolutely not.